Bonjour, uh, je me nomme Stéphanie Bouchard. Hello, my name is Stephanie Bouchard. I am a lawyer and I work at the Policy Centre for Victim Issues of the Department of Justice Canada. It is a great pleasure for me to be the moderator for the last, but not least, expert panel that will discuss promising practices for preventing sexual assault against adults in Canada and other common law countries. They will also cover discussion sessions on traditional procedures in the criminal justice system, including restorative justice. Um, I will briefly introduce to you the panel. Uh, as you're more than aware, the full bios are in the binders. And because of some travel um, arrangements, uh, we will start the discussion um, with... Um, Joanne Wemmers, uh, who is from the International Centre for Comparative Criminology of University of Montreal. Uh, then Melanie Randall, who's Professor of the Faculty of Law at University of Western Ontario, will be speaking. Um, and uh, then we will have Kate Mackenzie Brittle, who is Senior Legal and Policy Advisor of the New Zealand Law Commission. So she's, she's travelled very far to join us today. Um, and then we will have um, others that you've seen earlier today, Jill Whitkin uh, from the Crown Law Office of Ontario, and also Carmen Rieu, Crown Attorney from Quebec speaking. So we'll start more with the restorative justice component, and then we will move into New Zealand and the um, Ontario and Quebec action plans. All right. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, my apologies for changing the order, but I, I have to catch my train. I have to teach in the morning. Um, uh, today I'm talking about restorative justice in cases of uh, sexual violence. Last night I was reminded that I think seven, less than 10 minutes to do it. So um, I started immediately with my conclusion. So I thought, <laughs> whoop, if, oh, uh, it's, let me think. There we go. I thought if all ails sure. fails, at least they'll have yes. known where I was going. So now how did I get here? This is the question. Talk fast. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're saying here is, I think my argument is that it's time to stop um, deciding, judging victims really, uh, and to start listening to them and to develop innovative responses that meet their needs, promote healing while respecting the rights of the accused. And I think that it was interesting for me today hearing bits and pieces of this come from the different speakers throughout the day. Um, and I think that that's something that, for me at least, is a take-home message uh, that it's, it seems to resonate with both victims and those working as defense with the accused. Um, unfortunately, what happens is we end up judging victims far too often um, in the criminal justice system and outside of it. So, how do I get here? Well, justice, the attrition, we talked about that all day, the justice gap, so I'm not going to talk about that. The alternatives, what alternatives are there to uh, the criminal justice? Because obviously, if the criminal justice system isn't working, well, what alternative do we have? We know, we saw it already, one in 20 victims of sexual assault will report to the police. What's interesting is that back in 99, the um, General Social Survey included a bit on restorative justice, alternatives to justice, and they asked specific questions to victims about mediation. And they explained to victims, what is mediation? Because of course, many wouldn't know it if it wasn't explained to them. And even for victims of sexual assault, one in four said that that was interesting, would have been an interesting interesting thing for them in their particular case. Well, that becomes really interesting when only one in 20 is reporting to the police. So before we go judging uh, restorative justice, clearly victims are saying they're actually more interested in that than they were in reporting to police. So I think that that's something to bear in mind. Well, what else? Obviously, this is just one study. That was a while ago. Will it still apply? Um, well, research elsewhere, for example, in the States, has come to very similar conclusions that um, re restorative justice, the majority of victims uh, of sexual assault in, in these studies, uh, is very interested in restorative justice in addition to criminal justice, and some of them as an alternative to it. 30% in one study as an alternative to criminal justice. So there are different ways that we can envision it as something, an add-on to criminal justice or in, as a diversion. Um, but I think it's important to keep an open mind. We don't have to choose right away. And what's also interesting is that, in particular, 
particular when the victim knows her offender, this is something victims seem to be more interested in. And we know that was often the case in cases of uh, sexual violence that victims know their offenders uh, in the majority. So I think it's time to start listening to victims. Um, unfortunately, however, there's a lot of resistance to this notion of restorative justice in cases of sexual violence. We saw it here in Canada with the Dalhousie Facebook incident. Um, that was quite clear where there were protests um, on the street telling the university that they were shirking their responsibility towards the victims, uh, victims were being abandoned, et cetera. Whereas, uh, actually, it was a very interesting option. They, the, the university took very seriously what was going on. Um, they engaged, uh, um, they were fortunate enough to have on their staff Jennifer Llewellyn, who was an expert in uh, restorative justice and a member of their law faculty, and she put together a wonderful, well-coordinated response that listened to victims um, at, throughout the process. And uh, if you, there's a, a number of uh, documents, uh, publications on that that have now been published, uh, including testimonials by the victims included. And one of the things that the victims talks about, uh, talk about are how they were shocked, um, hurt, uh, by the protests uh, that were happening outside, as though people weren't supporting their choice, which was a very well thought out choice. They didn't want to see these um, classmates um, um, have their careers thrown away and expelled from the university. More importantly, and that was again something we heard this morning, they were really concerned about, well, what about in the future if they take this behavior into the workplace? These are guys that will often be working in, in dental offices. Uh, many of the support staff, the hygienists, the administrators, uh, the receptionists will be women. And they might not feel like they can stand up to what might be their superior and say, hey, that's not acceptable behavior. So they felt it was very important that they, as their equals, stood up and said, no, what's, what you did is wrong and this is why. It also enabled a dialogue which um, unveiled uh, a situation or a culture of misogyny, of sexism uh, in the university, which had allowed these, this Facebook to be page group to be created in the first place. So it was able to address the bigger issues outside of the particular relationship. It was very good, very healing for the victims, for the offenders, from a prevention uh, point of view, as well as from an institutional point of view for the university and uh, beyond. So that as our example, but again, the resistance, the, the negative attitudes uh, immediately by the public, who, who of course were not out to, to hurt the victims, but to protect them. That was the important thing. That's where it becomes very um, uh, important to think about. When you think you're, um, where are we going? The resistance, da 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 da. Uh, protection, it, this is, comes from the idea that we have to protect the victims, they're vulnerable. And, and yeah, we do have to, that is a very real concern, protecting victims. However, how we do that is also important. Um, clearly the criminal justice system, it has some protective measures, but we've already talked about how hard it is on the victims. Um, we don't want another secondary victimization in these restorative justice programs. There are ways that we can organize the process um, and uh, what measures, precautionary measures that can be taken um, to reduce the risk of secondary victimization. And that's really important. Um, also important to point out the benefits, how are we doing, for victims. Um, the research with, there has been some research, limited research, I'll mind you, but um, some research with restorative justice programs, and you'll hear more about uh, uh, New Zealand among other places, uh, has been quite uh, innovative in that sense. And it shows the reduction in post-traumatic stress symptoms of victims who participate in these programs. Um, feeling of empowerment, regaining a sense of control, which anyone who works in clinical psychology will tell you is really important for the person's healing process, the ability to uh, be able to make choices. Um, and there are some very innovative programs integrating restorative justice in a therapeutic context so that it becomes a, a step in the victim's healing process. And it's victim-centered, it's victim-oriented or victim-initiated. Um, Information empowers choice, and this is one of the things that, that, that people often say is that, well, we don't want to talk about it because we might upset the victim. Then. And so if the victim asks for it, well then sure, maybe we'll, uh, we'll talk about restorative justice, but the victim has to ask for it first. And it's important, I think, to point out the victims tell us they want to know. They want to know the options. 
And maybe today it's not a good idea for me, but maybe I can come back to that later. Maybe later on in my healing process, it'll be something that will be helpful or something that I want. And that's important that that option is there. Um, how are we doing? Do you think I'll get to the end of this? Two minutes. Two minutes. All right. Um, accountability, also very important. Again, this is something that's interesting in the research that has been done is that because restorative justice, you have to, it's, it's a voluntary thing. The offenders going into it already recognize the responsibility, which I thought was really interesting hearing the defense lawyers today talking about how um, their clients often would be willing to recognize responsibility, but uh, when you know that you're immediately going on a sex offender register list, that the cost associated with it all actually discourages that acknowledgement. And for victims, that acknowledgement is so important. And that's, I think, a vital difference between restorative justice and criminal justice, is that it starts off already saying, yes, there's, uh, I believe you, or yes, there's this recognition of, of the harm or uh, of the wrongdoing. And what was interesting as well is that through the dialogue, the studies suggest that there's actually a deeper understanding of, of their responsibility for their behavior. Um, so that it can be actually um, uh, helpful in that sense as well. Um, well, how to organize it? Well, I think that's, I have one minute left, exactly. And we're not going to decide that. I, the key word here is flexibility. Um, because cases can be so different, victims can be so different. And I think the important thing here is that um, we listen to victims and uh, what they are telling us about what they want, what they need. And uh, alternatives to criminal justice um, may offer an alternative, a healthy, a helpful, positive uh, path for victims. Um, and don't judge their choice. Just because a victim wants to do restorative justice doesn't mean um, it didn't happen or that she's uh, more uh, culpable, uh, responsible for what happened. It's a, a healthy, um, it's, it's her choice, and we need to respect victims' choices. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Keep going. I gotta go, sorry. Thank you, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm also here to speak a little bit about the possibilities for a restorative process for speaking uh, for addressing crimes of gendered violence. And uh, I want to acknowledge that it's very controversial within the women's movement. And I'm a little bit scared that my pal Tracy Porteous is going to rush the mic and argue with me about this because she's never heard me address it. And it is, uh, it's a controversial topic within the women's movement. I think there's a lot of interesting things that we have to discuss about if it can be done and how it can be done well. So um, I want to begin with the observation that might seem actually paradoxical, which is that um, the criminal justice system sometimes actually works in sexual assault cases. And uh, I want to suggest that there are sometimes successes and sometimes positive outcomes. And they're rare, but they occasionally do work. And we've also had some stellar law reform successes, and they've been acknowledged a few times today. Uh, we've got some incredible law on the books. I think our affirmative consent standard in the criminal code is a huge achievement and something to be proud of. Um, now, the theory is fantastic. The practice is the subject of another presentation. and <laughs> The news is saturated with the, the failure to actually bring the affirmative consent standard to fruition in the case law. But if it actually had been, we'd have a very different body of case law. Um, and I think that maybe it's just a coping strategy I have to kind of wanting to point that out, but I do think it's important that we recognize that. Uh, and I also think that we have to recognize that there are many, many people within the context of the criminal justice system doing really impressive and heroic work on the front lines. And that includes uh, community organizations and victim services and women's groups, um, police, crowns and lawyers, judiciary, parole, government and beyond. And, and we work in a very different, difficult context and people are doing really, really difficult work. And I think it's important to recognize that. And I would also like to give a shout out to, again, Tracy Porteous and Eva for leading the whole province in doing trauma-informed criminal justice system. They're doing some incredible work there in British Columbia. So um, that's just, I guess, all to set up uh, how, how big we know the deficiencies are in the criminal justice system. And I don't think we should abandon the criminal justice system. I think we need to continue to, con 
to make it a more robust system and to, to keep those law reform um, successes moving forward and to try to make it as improved a system as we can. Nevertheless, sometimes I wonder if we are tinkering at the edges. Um, so I do think that we need to think about more innovative and creative approaches and that restorative approaches can complement what we do within the context of the criminal justice system. And they can be either parallel and outside and community-based or they actually could be situated within the criminal justice system. So there's a whole range of ways in which we could build restorative approaches uh, into the criminal justice system or outside of it. So none of the pragmatic stuff is something we can talk about today, there's not time. I can only discuss the conceptual and aspirational kind of aspects of it today. And I think I was invited to discuss this because of a paper I wrote which I um, titled uh, why, why Feminists Should Engage with Restorative Justice Practices. And for this, I blame my colleague, Jennifer Llewellyn, with whom I went to law school, who invited Laurie and I to actually work on this project on restorative justice and think about its applicability for crimes of gendered violence. And she invited me because I was pretty hostile to, to it, actually. And I was a big critic. And I thought, I actually really admired her for inviting me because I was pretty opposed to thinking about using restorative justice for crimes of gendered violence. And I thought, I really admired her bringing a critic in. So I titled the paper I eventually published uh, from vaguely hostile critic to someone who's sort of cautiously engaging now with restorative justice. So I think we need a conceptual shift away from centering on the justice interest um, of the accused, which is what the criminal justice trial is all about, to the justice interests and rights of victims. And I don't think that the criminal justice system has the capacity to do that. For all of the law reforms that we've, we've uh, put in place, I think that the system just does not have the capacity in a full way to actually center those concerns. It, it's not designed to do that. So we have to, to, to shift our thinking away from the strictures of that system and what actually happens in it um, and, and think outside our legal training. And it's very hard for those of us who are legally trained to do it because we internalize the rules and norms of the legal system even as we're critics of it. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. But I think an outright rejection of restorative approaches to, to crimes of gendered violence um, and an outright refusal to even think about what it might look like to take a restorative approach to crimes of gendered violence actually refuses to take seriously the feminist critique of the profound limits of the criminal justice system and fails to honor the feminist insights into uh, what women actually need to process and resolve the harms and experiences of gender violence. So the three overarching principles that I think should guide our thinking about what a restorative or innovative or creative alternative model for a processing crimes of gendered violence might look like um, are that it needs to be equality focused and committed to social justice. There's been a lot of talk about trauma-informed, and I totally believe in work being trauma-informed, and Lori and I do a lot of work on doing trauma-informed kind of practice, but I think that trauma-informed alone is insufficient. It has to be actually equality-focused and trauma-informed, so those would be the two um, kind of principles, and I actually think trauma-informed practice is a form of social change. So equality-focused and trauma-informed, and the third overarching principle I would say is that it has to, any kind of model that we'd want to think about, set of practices, would have to start with and draw on the decades of expertise that has been built up in the violence against women sector. And I cannot overemphasize that point enough, uh, that there's so much skill, knowledge, and expertise in that sector that that has to be the starting point for thinking about what would a model look like. Um, and in a, in a context of um, shortage of resources and a tendency towards privatization, I would be extremely concerned about any kind of a political move towards uh, looking at restorative approaches as a cost-saving measure. That's not, I think actually that they're very resource intensive when they're done properly, and so it, this is not a cheap and easy fix. It's an extremely laborious, careful set of processes but um, it actually is a much more radical social change uh, long-term and actually has a much more um, prevention-focused laying the groundwork for actually ending gender violence in a much bigger way. So it, I think there's a huge um, social benefit to doing it 
to doing it well. So in terms of uh, a few more comments about the why, what I mean by restorative. Um, a restorative process means uh, a process by which all of the parties that have a stake in a particular form of wrongdoing or an offense come together to resolve collectively uh, what happened and to deal with the aftermath of the offense and its implications for the future and to kind of think about what does resolution look like. Um, so there's an expanded conception of who the harmed parties are and they include not only the victim and the offender but also the community and that's a fairly significant um, change because again the criminal justice system has no real capacity to engage the community as a meaningful party and that is very consistent with the feminist analysis that crimes of gendered violence should not be seen as individualized and privatized but actually need to be taken as social problems and pu public problems and problems for which we need to take social responsibility so there's a, a huge actually um, social and political piece to thinking about restorative justice in this way. Um, and I think that a lot of the resistance to thinking about doing restorative justice is that it's been done in traditional ways that is very offender focused and has, doesn't take uh, victim interest seriously. So by restorative, I don't mean offender focused in the traditional ways restorative justice has been done, but a, a focus on offenders is still important. But I mean a victim centered restorative approach. Um, so a, a truly feminist-led, victim-centered restorative approach gives us an expanded conception of what the harms are associated with sexual violence and what the remedies might look like and critically engages the community as well as a party in the process. Um, and just to a final point, I think that it, a, a restorative process actually would create the space for undoing one of the biggest harms that happens in a criminal trial, which is uh, the distortion, demeaning, fracturing of the victim's narrative of the what happened. Um, it's one of the greatest injuries of the criminal trial. It's one of the greatest features of the hostile court, what Elaine Craig in her writing has called the inhospitable court. There's been decades of research on this, the re-traumatization of what happens to victims in criminal trials, the violence done to women in trying to describe what happened to them in an episode of sexual violence. And the construction of a meaningful narrative is essential to healing from a, a crime of gendered violence. Um, and so that is the antithesis of what happens in a criminal trial. A criminal trial has no capacity for a meaningful victim narrative. It's just not possible. So um, the construction of a meaningful narrative is something that might be possible in a, a, a feminist-led restorative process. So I'll just end with a quote from uh, one of my favorite writers, Judith Herman, and she actually said uh, something that has been very often quoted, which is that um, if one set out to, to um, to create something that induced system, systems of trauma it might look like a court of law. That is not actually what I was going, which is a sad statement, um, but what the quote I wanted to use is, ties in with this idea of the importance of narrative. And she says, the victim demands action, engagement, and remembering. Remembering and telling the truth about terrible events are prerequisites, both for the restoration of the social order and for the healing of individual victims. And here I think she integrates both the micro individual levels and the macro social levels of what we need to actually take seriously the idea of both individual and social responsibility for ending gendered violence. Thank you. You want this one? Um, bonjour. Um, hello, my name is Kate, um, and I'm from New Zealand. Je m'appelle Kate. Je suis my name is Kate. I'm from New Zealand. Please forgive me. I speak only a little French. But I would now like to speak Indigenous language. I wish to give you a welcome and introduction in Te Reo Māori, which is the language of our indigenous people of New Zealand. Ko kotirana me erirangi o ko tipuna, ko rangi tuhi te maunga, 
ko kai farafara te awa, no whanganui a tara ahau, ko Kate Mackenzie Bridal ahau. Ngā tangata o te akamatua o te turi, me ngā tangata o Aotearoa e mihi ana ki a koutou. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I just gave you a little of my history. My relatives are from Scotland and England. Um, I gave you the name of my mountain and my river close to where I live and my name. And then I passed on greetings from the New Zealand Law Commission and the people of New Zealand. I'm going to start by giving a disclaimer. And um, I understand you know, lawyers are good at giving disclaimers. And I understand Canadians are quite good at disclaimers too. Because I lived in Vancouver for um, a year, about 20 years ago and was very surprised to have to keep on signing these things, giving away all my rights. There were these disclaimers that you couldn't do this or that, but maybe it was just Vancouver, maybe it's not a, a Canadian thing. Uh, my disclaimer is that I'm not speaking for the New Zealand government today. I'm, I'm very honoured and privileged to have been invited here to speak on behalf of the New Zealand Commission. Um, I wasn't specifically chosen um, by you, but um, <laughs> I was involved in the report that you are interested in hearing about, which was um, the report that our commission did on the criminal justice response to uh, victims of sexual violence, which was, um, we published a couple of years ago, the end of 2015, well, not, not quite two years ago. Um, I've worked for three years at the Law Commission as a legal and policy advisor. Um, previously, I worked in private practice for, for 20 years, and mostly in, in the area of family law. I feel that I'm talking to you today on the shoulders of giants in the sense that um, there are many of you here, most of you here will be much more specialised in this area of sexual violence than I than I am, and the many people that uh, we consulted with in the course of our research are much more experienced. We are very much generalists in our Law Reform Commission, and we um, become skilled in the area that we are writing about, but we don't claim to be experts, so I, I feel even more privileged from, from that um, basis to be able to address you, because um, of what I've learnt, um, it's been a journey for me at the same time. Um, I knew a lot, of, well, a fair amount about domestic violence from my practice as a family lawyer, but I hadn't really encountered sexual violence so much, and it was very much the silent um, form of violence. It was easier to talk about domestic violence, strangely enough. It's easier to say that you've been hit than you've been raped. And so that would factor into my discussions with clients, but I didn't really understand the dynamic that I came to, to learn about as we went through the report. Um, I guess I also just want to give a, a little disclaimer about terminology. There's been a little discussion about terminology. Um, what's the right term to use? A victim or alleged victim, perpetrator, offender? Um, we um, wrote a disclaimer in our report um, that the, the terminology that's used by the, uh, the, the violence sector is that of victim and an offender or perpetrator even though that's not the preferred terminology of the legal sector, but that's, that's the terminology that I will be using um, now. And, and I guess similarly to say, um, you know, it may be appropriate too to be using the words, the terms victim survivor, of course, or just survivor. Um, and I want to acknowledge that victims are not just victims, they are survivors. Um, our story in New Zealand um, really started, I guess, um, the, the story I'm going to tell is about an incremental change, I suppose, over the last, um, since the mid-2000s. And that's not to say that we have got anything or everything sorted. We perhaps have taken um, a slightly different different path. And um, some, yeah, some exciting reforms, I think, are in the pipeline. Um, and our story really starts in New Zealand with a very brave woman hope I can work this out. Um, called Louise Nicholas. And Louise Nicholas was a young woman in New Zealand, slightly older than me, and in the mid-80s, um, when she was 13, she was um, raped by a police officer in her small town. 
she tried to report it at that time, but um, there was a friend of the police officer, and so he discouraged her from taking it any further. She then basically was targeted as someone who wouldn't resist, and this police officer would often sexually violate her. This continued even through her mid-teens, and more police officers in the broader district um, found out that she was easy. And so she was raped on numerous occasions by police, and even using a baton. And this went on until she was, I think, in her late teens, and she met a lovely man who she's now married to, and that's her there with her family and children. Um, she, as we've heard today, she didn't, well, she did actually initially try and make a complaint. She was discouraged. She then, I think, you know, <laughs> the police had failed her quite clearly. Um, so she, but she raised the matter again, but some 10 years down the track in the mid-90s. To add insult to injury, the man who she confided in, a police officer, seemed to take her complaint seriously and proceedings were brought against these men, but he deliberately gave hearsay evidence at the trial and the trial was aborted. There was another trial and he did the same thing. That was the mid-90s. Then, by the mid-2000s, an investigative journalist heard about these police officers and he had discovered that they actually had committed, some of them, other offences, and the word was that they were in jail, but this had been suppressed because there was about to be, um, because of Louise, well, maybe I've got the story not quite right there, but anyway, the, the, no one, it wasn't published abroad at that point in time. So he dug around and encouraged Louise to make a further complaint and to take further advice. And there ended up being a further <laughs> trial at which these police officers were acquitted. Women around the country from sexual violence groups in particular, even though there were suppression orders because these men, were two of them were in prison for already having raped another young woman, um, started distributing pamphlets which breached the suppression order. But word started to get around and there became, at the end of the trial, there was public outrage that these men were already in jail for something similar yet the jury didn't know about it and that would have made all the difference. That was the feeling anyhow. Well, Louise never secured a conviction against those men. They, they, they weren't ever convicted. The, the police officer who ostensibly was helping her and he was eventually um, convicted of perverting the course of justice. But um, as a result of her standing up and letting her name be known and coming forward, a lot of other victims started to come forward and speak up. And it started to change um, some of the culture. The Prime Minister of New Zealand at the time was a woman. I think that probably made a difference. She ordered an, an internal inquiry into police conduct immediately at a commission of Royal Commission of Inquiry. There was internal police inquiries into uh, the conduct of the police. The police ended up being subject to Auditor General um, oversight reports and regular reporting. I'm not going to talk specifically about that because that's not part of what we looked into, but um, certainly police conduct and practice has changed significantly as a result. And Louise today is involved in training the police um, at the Police, we have only one police force in New Zealand, and she's involved in the training of young recruits now around sexual violence, as well as other advocacy work. Um, so many things um, resulted from her brave action. Um, and the Law Commission became involved at that point because there was concern about the rules of evidence around um, should the previous bad character of people um, of defendants uh, be known, similar fact fending. Our conclusion at that time when we issued our report in 2008 was that the, the rules of evidence were okay, but the way that victims of sexual violence were treated in the adversarial court process was not okay. And we suggested that there needed to be an inquiry into that. We were subsequently then given a reference from the government to look into those matters. And it was a very high, um, a, a high level uh, terms of reference. So we were to look at 
the pre-trial and trial processes in criminal cases, whether the adversary framework within which those processes operate should be modified or changed in order to improve the system's fairness, effectiveness and efficiency with particular focus on sexual offence cases. And it was to include an examination of inquisitorial models. So at that point, um, some of the team from the Law Commission, I, I was not working there at the time, went to Europe to study some of the civil systems there in Germany, Austria, Denmark, France, and the Netherlands. Um, if you're interested to see the summaries of, of what they said about those various systems, they're in appendices contained, um, so on our website, the Law Commission New Zealand, just Google Law Commission New Zealand, you'll find our website, and the first paper that we did, the alternative trial process, in the appendices, it sets out the summaries of those jurisdictions. At the same time, there was a companion book that was funded, two academics edited a book um, called From Real Rape to Real Justice, uh, Elizabeth MacDonald and Yvette Tinsley, and they did a huge amount of work that kind of went alongside the Law Commission's report. They particularly focused on sexual violence. Our report was did cover sexual violence, but was also considering whether there could be changes more broadly in the criminal justice system. So the report looked at um, pre-trial processes, characteristics of trial, trial procedure, sexual violence court, and alternative process. Now, I need to say, before you get your hopes up too high, or perhaps you before the shock value <laughs> wears off, whoops, um, that these inquisitorial recommendations that came out of here were roundly rejected. Um, the government really took fright, but I will come to that in a moment. But they, there were some interesting ideas in there. Um, I don't think I've got this on a slide. No, I don't. So I've, I've set this out in the handout in your pack. It's um, detailed a little, a little more, but there were some interesting ideas, like victims to be involved with charging decisions. They could have a right of review of charging decisions uh, or pleas and mitigate changes in, uh, in pleas and mitigation. Um, oh, sorry, but plea bargaining. Um, victims to have an, an independent sexual violence advisor, an individually assigned to them from the time of their complaint to travel with them throughout the whole process through to the end of the court proceedings. That person would be their support person and their information person, um, would know about the court process and be able to advise them of their rights, advise them of what to expect the, the whole way through. There was a recommendation or a suggestion, um, sorry, at this stage it was all discuss up for discussion, um, so there were options being floated. Uh, give judges more control, so a pre-trial dossier with evidence from the defence and prosecution. The judge could decide which witnesses, the order of witnesses, whether there should be expert evidence, if more investigation should be required. So very much drawing from inquisitorial systems, um, civil systems. And I guess very radically was the idea that perhaps there shouldn't be a jury in some kinds of cases, especially sexual violence cases, perhaps just a judge and two assessors. But if there was to be a jury, then uh, cases needed to be fast-tracked, there should be pre-recording of all evidence and cross-examination, and the use of intermediaries for, um, to assist in questioning where, where there was difficulties and a victim understanding questioning of a child or a vulnerable person. Alongside that was a therapeutic model of um, a, a sexual violence court, which would be a post-guilty court. Someone would have to plead guilty, go to a special court. I think, well, I know in the States they have drug courts. I'm not sure whether you utilise that model of therapeutic court here. Something similar where there would be support for someone to go through a therapeutic process and that might then have an impact on their sentence. And lastly, an alternative process, a restorative justice type of process completely outside of the traditional court system. Well, when these ideas were published, there was a new Minister of Justice with different priorities, and she, we think, perhaps took fright at some of the suggestions that were made. 
there were certainly um, rumours going around that we were trying to um, change the onus of proof and erode the right to silence, which, um, of course, along with... We weren't, those weren't our intentions, but they could be perhaps read into some of the suggestions. Um, so the important thing I think we learnt from that was you've got to get people on side first if you're going to make radical changes or, or suggestions even, and that to really let people engage and understand, even when you're just floating options, people get their backs, backs up. Um, Perhaps if we'd also limited those reforms to just talking about sexual violence, not the whole criminal justice um, report that, uh, system, that may have um, gone down better as well. So anyway, fast forward to um, the, so that was 2000, early 2012, we published that report. We were told to put it on hold, the project, which was very unusual, um, and not complete to a final report. So at the end of 2014, we had another very high profile incident where some teenage girls, um, so, or some teenage boys, were boasting online um, of their sexual exploits with young, drunk 13 and 14 year old girls who are underage. And there was outrage that the police had said because no complaint had been made, nothing could be done. The positive from that was that actually people were immediately outraged and were talking about it, whereas at the time that um, Louise Nicholas first raised her complaint, people were dubious, you know, didn't necessarily believe her. Women's groups believed her, but not necessarily other people. But the climate has started to change. Um, so the Minister of Justice, another one by then, still the same national administration, but third Minister of Justice, um, directed us to continue with our report, but focus just on um, victims or complainants and just sexual offence cases, and not to, oops, not to look at any proposal that would reverse the onus of proof. So our final report then, which I was involved with, um, looked at it was a much more, shall we say, conservative report. Um, our president, I think, was quite cautious to take on board what had happened with the first uh, issues, our discussion paper, and so this ended up being, in some ways, a more conservative report, especially as regards the court proposals. So there was some, a major proposal in there was, so these were the four um, heads of proposals, the court experience of complainants, court specialisation for sexual violence cases, an alternative process, and the establishment of a sexual violence commission. So we were, with the, for the court experience, um, we made some recommendations around reducing the time for hearing, giving information to victims, court layout. The probably more significant ones were, again, recommending the individual um, sexual violence advisor position be established to walk alongside a victim in the process. Um, we recommended the pre-recording of evidence and allow that to include cross-examination with the aim that this would reduce the drama in the courtroom in front of the jury, um, reduce delay. Well, if, if there is delay in, in the hearing of a case, at least the, the uh, spectre of cross-examination is not hanging over the head of the victim or, or a child, the, the length of delay affecting their, their memory. We left open the door to the use of intermediaries as well. But the more significant um, aspect was around the sexual violence, a specialist sexual violence court. Now, as I said, we were kind of conservative in that we've just recommended initially that this be a pilot court uh, with trained judges, council administration staff, and only designated judges to sit. It's a little harder to require defence counsel to be necessarily trained because people are free to choose um, their legal counsel, but most people who are defending sexual violence charges do so on legal aid paid by the state. So we thought you could introduce an accreditation requirement that all lawyers who did legal aid work need to be trained around sexual violence and around rape culture and myths. 
So judges already do have training around that generally. They have had, I think, since the Louise Nicholas case. Um, the, but there has been more intensive uh, training recently. Um, we also have what's, I, you've, there was some reference here to this, we call it counterintuitive evidence. So at a sexual violence, in a sexual violence case, um, our Supreme Court has permitted the use of expert evidence um, to inform the jury as to rape myths and to inform so that they understand why a victim may have acted as they did act, which may be counterintuitive to what people might think would happen. And that happens in a variety of ways. It's not standardised. Sometimes a judge might give a kind of summing up about it. Sometimes it's an expert. So we had made some recommendations around trying to standardise that. Um, our hope, I think, with this court is that after it, there's to be an evaluation after two years, and in that time, we were also, um, at the same time as we issued our report, we were going through a, a modernisation of our um, court system. So there was a bit of a reluctance to try and do any tinkering in the meantime, which is why we didn't specifically recommend a legislated court for sexual violence. Plus there's quite a lot of cost, you know, there's cost implications with that and whether there's sufficient work just for a sexual violence court or whether in fact you take away too much work from the district court if you create a whole sexual violence court. But the pilot hopefully gives a chance to see whether such a court is sustainable with its own rules, uh, its own legislation. We have our own family court and a, and a youth court, which are governed by their own separate pieces of legislation with slightly differing rules of evidence for each. It also leaves open the question of who the fact finder should be. Although we didn't make a, a recommendation, as I said, around the question of the jury, we, we did go as far as saying that sexual violence is not well suited to fact-finding by a jury comprised of 12 laypersons for the very reason that each jury carries the, the myths of sexual violence and of rape culture, and they need to be educated each time, which is a huge um, effort uh, and doesn't necessarily... Well, I guess there's, there's... I'm not quite sure that the evidence is that it necessarily works to educate the jury in that way. So we are hoping that there might be more time for an alternative to just, um, so with the time to consider in the next two years whether a judge and two assessors, whether they are professionals or lay people might be considered, whether this may be appropriate in a court uh, that's just dedicated to sexual violence. It would get rid of the need for rules, for many rules of evidence. It would help with the victimiser, with reducing the trauma and potential for re-victimisation for, um, for the victim and hopefully administrative costs also. Now of course I should say that in response to our report um, the government has said yes there is certainly a case here but we need to do more consider this further and do more work. So that's that's the, the official response. The Chief District Court Judge has decided she's going to start the pilot anyway. So it has been started as, in as much as she can control that administratively in two courts with the main aim really of, spe of speeding things up. Having a more empathetic environment, having judges who are trained, counsel who are interested and hopefully have received some training, um, and yes, we, so we wait to see. That just started um, very late last year. Um, the first pre-trial conferences will be in March. They're going to be more intensively managed. All right, I see. Goodness, I've only got five, questions, uh, five minutes left. Um, so I'm going to... Um, it's good that Melanie and Joanne went through um, restorative justice because I'm going to have to speed through it. We also recommended a sexual violence commission, which the government has said, yes, there does need to be... Um, Coordination of services, we're going to look at that through another means. 
Um, so quickly, the, the alternative, well, we've, um, it was interesting to hear, to hear only at the sen in the sentencing panel, you know, one size doesn't fit all, and, you know, so we need to have different responses. Well, that was the clear view that um, Elizabeth MacDonald and Yvette Tinsley formed when they did their consultation for their book. They weren't expecting to write about an alternative process to court because that, that was not their focus, but they found that amongst victim support groups there was a there was a call for something else, not just the criminal justice system. It treats treats us poorly. There's um, you know no we, so many people don't want to go through the system because of of um, how it re-traumatizes people, and there's no incentive either for um, offenders to go th to to do anything uh, to, to participate. Sorry, no incentive for offenders to plead guilty, like we heard today. There's so many cases don't resolve because of the high the high um, stakes. They're going to inevitably, well, in New Zealand, they will never to be get a custodial sentence. So we've heard about how the in the adversarial process the state takes the victim's place. Um, it's just not a process that is well suited to, to meet victims' needs. Now, um, I think um, one of our earlier presenters, sorry, her name has escaped my mind, but she started, to, she referred to some of these matters. What victims need, so... Um, Judith Herman and um, Mary, I think, Koss. Mary Koss, and Kathleen Daly, who's an Australian criminologist and has written extensively in this area, have together identified what victims need. They need, they need to participate in a system. They want to tell their story, to have a voice. They need to be validated. They need vindication. And they want the perpetrator to be held to account. And as... Melanie said, Judith Herman said, if you want to design a system that's going to do the most harm to victims, well, just, well, it's, the adversarial system comes pretty close to that. It doesn't meet these needs of victims. So in New Zealand at the moment, we do have the ability for post-sentence um, post restorative justice um, process for sexual violence, and that is occurring um, on a regular basis now as of... About a year ago, it was extended to sexual violence, and there are good practice guidelines for that. Only accredited people can, can run that. But what we were outlining in our report was the possibility of having a process completely outside of the court system. And it's um, controversial, for sure, um, but there's a lot of questions raised about, well, how would that work, and how would it work for this kind of offender, and how would, it, how would you protect people, and so on. But, um, you know, we've only got, well, for you, you've only got 6% of people reporting. We've only got 10%. What about all the rest of them? I mean, surely we can design a system that at least can't, you know, helps some, some others of those um, who aren't opting to go through the criminal justice system at the moment. Um, so we've, we proposed a, 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 um, an alternative. We, we, we have a, a, a um, system at the moment which... It's called Project Restore, and they work extensively with um, preparing victims and preparing offenders who acknowledge responsibility. Um, they may not end up meeting, they may, there may be a proxy in place of the victim, but the aim is to bring healing and restoration, to answer the questions, to have accountability. Um, so we had a model, we have a model there, how it's actually designed. Well, we put a lot of kind of thought and effort into what it potentially could look like, so at least the minister had a bit of an idea. Um, but it's very hard, it's very hard to say, it's very hard to design um, a completely foolproof model. But, you know, maybe in preparation for coming here, I talked to um, a commissioner that was at the Law Commission at the time that the first report was... Um, written and the alternative process was proposed at that time and he said um, he has we had 500 people submit on the on, on all of our proposals we're a country of four million so it's not too bad and everybody was in favor I think there's like four negative responses 
um, people are wanting something. Um, they want, as um, Joanne mentioned before, if that's what the victim wants, then you know we should be listening to that. And there's no, um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of questions about how you protect people and how you ensure that society is you know, not at risk and so on. But at the end of the day, um, you know, maybe, the, maybe society's need for denunciation and retribution should come second to what the individual victim in the case actually wants. Um, I wanted to, to talk about your um, high Aboriginal um, rate of, um, of women that have been offended against, um, because we have a similar statistic in New Zealand with Māori women, probably not quite as bad as from what I've heard here. Um, but these, and we haven't, I haven't heard today anyway, I don't think, about the use of Aboriginal restorative justice. There was a mention last night, but I understand that does happen. So, you know, there, there may be room there for something that actually will make some changes as well. I want to finish just reading, um, I just saw today, in for, well, it was yesterday in New Zealand, for International Women's Day, Louise Nicholas, amongst other people, was asked who her favourite heroine was. And she said, my favourite heroine is Louise Crawford, the little 13-year-old who thought that taking her own life would take away the shame she carried when she allowed bad things to happen to her, but lived to ensure that it was worthwhile, worthwhile living, as her experiences have helped other survivors of sexual violence know that they're not to blame, nor need to carry that shame. I think I need to go to New Zealand to see all their very interesting work that they've done. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit in, uh, about the Ontario strategy, and I, um, I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to do that. Um, <clears throat> those of us who are involved in it, I think, are, are very proud of the strategy and, and quite thankful, I know I am, that our government has uh, allocated resources towards this. Uh, the, if you recall, uh, there was a lot of press uh, in around 2013, 2014, a lot of sexual assaults that were taking place uh, in the military, uh, in the workplace, on universities. There was the Jean Gameshi allegations at the end of 2014. And so it was fortuitous that uh, the strategy uh, by our, our Premier Kathleen Wynne came out in March of 2015. It was building on a, on a strategy from 2011 to combat sexual violence, but uh, this one was quite a broad strategy. Uh, it actually crosses, it crosses a number of ministries and divisions. It has a number of uh, initiatives, including raising awareness and training, uh, safer, safer campuses and workplaces, uh, better supports in the communities and better outcomes in the justice sector. Uh, specifically to the justice sector, uh, there is uh, something, the main plank, I guess, of the action plan uh, for justice is called the enhanced prosecution model. And essentially what that is, uh, is a way to try to improve se all sexual assault prosecutions across the province and to try to... <clears throat> provide um, the best resources for all thousand of our crowns across the province. Uh, there is a, um, a, a group of us, I sit as the chair of the Sexual Violence Action uh, Group, and I, I sit in Toronto, but then I have a regional sexual violence crown in each of our six regions across the province. And we do this work full time, which is very rare for crowns, because sometimes in our system we might have experts or we might have teams of prosecutors that might work only on domestic violence or frauds or child abuse. But those are people that are in court all the time still because they're prosecuting the cases. We actually are able to uh, do this work. We, we do go to court a little bit, but we're, we're not in court every day. So so we have the time to be able to fulfill this work. Um, some of the work we're doing uh, just on a more on a policy level is uh, we, we're engaging, first of all, in, in a lot of interdisciplinary consultations with other groups, uh, with sexual assault nurse, nurse examiners, with victim witness, uh, with police, with sexual uh, assault 
centers. And, and the reason for that is that we all do this work and we're all very passionate about this work, but often, at least in the criminal justice system, we don't know what the others are doing. And, and sometimes that can create um, skepticism. It can maybe not lead to the best work or the best understanding of where everybody fits along the spectrum. And so we've found that meeting with these different groups, and uh, if I do a presentation for the sexual assault nurse examiners as to what, what happens in the courtroom and then vice versa, they do a presentation for us about exactly what is involved in their job. It really helps inform all of our work. So that's been really helpful. Um, we're working in conjunction with the Victims and Vulnerable Persons Division to create um, a public resource for survivors so that there's going to be a a public document that will explain the function of the criminal trial and uh, uh, how a victim uh, should approach or can approach it just so that they have an understanding of how a sexual trial works. We're also, we, uh, our group also considered many um, legislative changes that would be helpful for sexual assault prosecutions for victims and uh, we, we did a lot of work on that and we've put those forward for recommendation. Another, uh, 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 which I think was mentioned earlier by the minister, is another initiative is our independent legal advice pilot project. Uh, and what this is, and it's administered by the Victims and Vulnerable Persons Unit, uh, this is a, a pilot project which is taking place over two years. There are three pilot sites, Toronto, Ottawa, and Thunder Bay. And this involves four hours of free legal advice to any sexual assault survivor in any of those pilot sites. Uh, it doesn't matter if they have engaged the police. It doesn't matter if they're already in the criminal justice system. It doesn't matter if the uh, offense took place 20 years ago or a year ago or yesterday. They are entitled, if they apply, to four hours of legal advice. And we have a roster of lawyers who are providing this legal advice. They applied, they were uh, selected, they were trained. And the idea is not that all of them are providing advice about what happens in the criminal justice system. The idea for survivors is to give them choices so that they can understand what is involved in the criminal justice system, for instance, but also what would be involved if they uh, engaged a human rights tribunal or if they wanted criminal injuries compensation or if they wanted to go the civil route. So the lawyers that are on this roster are a cross-section of lawyers with different uh, experiences and backgrounds. And, and the idea is there's a, a bio for each lawyer. And so if a victim engages this program, they can look at which lawyer would be appropriate for them. Um, I mentioned earlier the issue of uh, third-party records not uh, sometimes victims not having uh, independent legal advice at that early stage before an application has been brought. That, for example, would be something that this independent um, legal advice program could fulfill, and I, and I think it's a really good program in that regard. <clears throat> More, um, I, I guess, more specific to prosecutions, what our group is doing is uh, we're really trying to assist prosecutors across the province when they are conducting these trials. Um, some of the things we're doing is we've rolled out a mentorship program so that no young crown who has come into the system should be doing a sexual assault case without a mentor. Uh, we act as mentors, but we've also identified about 100 mentors across the province in different offices and the same number of mentees. And uh, so a prosecution effectively would be done by both, usually the mentor taking the lead and the mentee watching and learning along the way. <clears throat> Mentors are trained on uh, making sure that the mentee understands uh, how to do a 276 application, even if it's not happening in their case, but you would have that conversation, you would go over uh, the law and strategy, et cetera. Uh, the other thing we've done is we've prepared a lot of resources for uh, easy access to a trial crown. So we have a database where we have draft FACTA, draft submissions, application records, uh, sentencing charts, things that are easily accessible to a crown when they're in the middle of a trial and something comes up, like a last minute 276 application where the seven days notice wasn't given. As I said earlier, it's not in the crown's interest all the time to have an adjournment so that we can prepare because that's not necessarily gonna be the best thing for the victim. So this allows the crown to go to our database to grab a fact and this is this is exactly the law this is what the arguments are we have uh, all different scenarios and all they would have to do is plug in their facts or uh, make the argument to the judge with that draft factum We've also prepared um, a best practices manual, and it's very dense. It's about two, over 200 pages single-spaced. And this is uh, available to all the crowns in our, 
uh, in the province, but it was designed, I guess, for the mentees, someone who's never done one of these prosecutions. Uh, and it covers, it's like an A to Z of sexual assault prosecutions. So it would cover what to do in the initial interview with the victim, what to do in the uh, conversation after the preliminary hearing, what to do in a resolution discussion with the victim, all sorts of evidentiary issues that come up here, say similar fact, uh, 276, etc. We also have chapters on, or sections on cultural barriers, vicarious trauma, um, how to properly object in a sexual assault trial uh, for, for inappropriate cross-examination, myths and stereotypes, the use of language, and um, sensitivity and responsiveness to Indigenous victims. And uh, I, I wrote that part, and I will admit that when I first wrote it as a Crown, um, I, I didn't get much help from uh, any Indigenous um, people that I knew, and when I had to present it to uh, the Aboriginal caucus, uh, it was not well received at all, let me just tell you that. <laughs> and um, it was a very humbling experience for me, but I was told it read like a checklist, and it was, you know, I, I really didn't understand the issues, and um, I took it back, and I took a, a a course on Aboriginal justice, and I talked to many people in the Aboriginal community, and they really taught me uh, a lot of what needed to be contained in this particular section. And that's, I guess, an example of, of us really talking to each other and making sure we're learning from each other. And I, I think it's, it's more helpful now. That section is actually called Wise Practices, Not Best Practices, something I learned um, from a very wise in Indigenous woman. So um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of what we're doing... Can I just have the clicker? Because uh, we, we want to make sure that we're, uh, do, oh, sorry, and I should say, I, I missed a couple things. We, we, uh, our group is uh, providing education, a lot of education for crowns, police, victim witness workers, everybody in the industry. We did six regional conferences last year. Um, Dr. Haskell was our keynote speaker at each and every one. And so that trauma-informed approach and the neuro education on the neuro neurobiology of trauma were certainly trying to spread across uh, the province. We uh, are, are training police on a regular basis, all different police forces, and we're really trying to standardize that training uh, so that we all know uh, what we're each teaching in different areas of the province and that it's the same thing. Um, and to the extent that we can include that neurobiology of trauma piece, if, if uh, Dr. Haskell hasn't made it to that police force, we are doing that and we are trying to <laughs> extend that. If we, we don't do nearly as good a job as her. I, I acknowledge that, but we're trying our best um, to make that work. <clears throat> um, I don't know if this is going to work. Okay, this may not work. And, oh, so hold on. Wait, I got to go back to the other one. Oh, okay. Well, the one I was looking for isn't there, but that's okay. Um, you're not going to be able to really see this, but what we are doing is we are collecting data. Um, we started July 1st with a, a data collection program where every case, every sexual assault case uh, with an adult victim that is disposed of as of July 1st, 2016, um, there's a data collection form that every crowd must fill out. And it'll cover things like what... Uh, Oh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so that's the form that the crowns have to fill out. It's got a drop-down menu, and it covers uh, really everything from the appropriate, whether the appropriate charge was laid by the police, the election, the case outcome, whether expert evidence was called, whether there was a preliminary hearing. If so, how long did the victim testify? Um, was committal argued? Was there a guilty plea after the preliminary hearing? Uh, the victim experience, what's the victim's relationship to the accused? Um, was there a victim interview? If so, how many? What was the timing of that? Does the victim have a lawyer? Are they, do they have a lawyer through the ILA program? Uh, was there a 276 application or a 278 application? What was the outcome? Were they brought within the notice period or outside of the notice period? Was there an adjournment? If so, why? Um, and, and then ultimately, what was the sentence? And so there's a lot of information we're collecting, and now it's being, I guess, accumulated and... Uh, so now I want to go to those color charts. Thank you. And so now it's sort of looking like this, and I can't see which one is on the board, but um, essentially that it gives you a snapshot of all the cases that we've collected, and there's 359 in total from July 1st until just recently. Uh, and then those then have been translated into this color-coded, uh, very fancy chart, where we can look at what the results are, and then we can even say, okay, if we want to take all those cases that result, uh, that are known offenders, and those would be the majority of the cases, we can actually drill down and get all that same information, but only for the cases for known offenders. Or if we want to look at all the cases where the charge was withdrawn, we can just take those cases and drill down and get all the 
the information, but only for the cases that were withdrawn. So th this is very new and it's a work in progress. And I'll tell you that the gray is um, where the, the uh, it's unknown, which means that the crowns maybe aren't filling out these forms as efficiently as they should be. So we have to work on that. So it is a work in progress, but we're really hoping that we can try to as at least try to figure out patterns. Um, you know, is there, uh, what is the problem with 276 applications? Um, are there lots of, an adjournment, of adjournments that are being asked for? And if so, why? Why are the courts allowing them? Um, things like that. Uh, how many cases are, uh, are being prosecuted in the Ontario Court of Justice, even if we go by indictment. So we're, we're trying to find patterns through this, and uh, we're hoping that we can inform uh, our work uh, over time with this type of data collection. I think my time's up, so I'm going to stop now. Back to French for a bit. In the package that you were issued this morning, you will find a document that summarizes the government strategy adopted by Quebec, where I work. It has a name that I'm not going to use every time I mention it. I'm going to use the full name only once. It's the Government Strategy for Preventing and Deterring Sexual Assault. It was adopted last October. It has a duration of five years. It's not the first government strategy to be adopted by Quebec. There have been a number of them since 2001. The last one will be in effect, I say the last one, into the future. I imagine that there will be others, but this one contains commitments that will have to be acted upon within five years, as well as annually. Each ministry or agency involved with this strategy must be accountable. So this means that it's a serious commitment. I'm not here to speak on behalf of Quebec. That's not my mandate at all. Instead, I have come to speak to you about something that involves me professionally, the commitments made by the Director of Criminal and Penal Prosecutions. Recall that, in Quebec, we have a prosecution system that is independent of the government. I'm going to mention to you all the ministries involved, and you will be able to see that the Department of Justice has commitments specific to it, and the Director of Criminal and Penal Prosecutions has some as well. Why a government strategy? Well, I think we can all get behind one idea. The idea being that sexual assault is a matter involving all of society. It is in this spirit of joint action and cooperation that it was adopted last fall, and, as I said, a number of ministries are involved. I'll list them for you quickly so that you can see the extent of the work. I told you about the Director of Criminal and Penal Prosecutions. There is the Ministère de la Famille, which includes the Secretariat aux Aînés, the Ministère de la Justice, which includes the Bureau de lutte contre l'homophobie, the Ministère de la Santé et des Services Sociaux, the Ministère de la Sécurité Publique, the Ministère de l'Éducation et de l'Enseignement Supérieur, the Ministère de l'Immigration, de la Diversité et de l'Inclusion, the Ministère des Affaires Municipales et de l'Occupation du Territoire, the Ministère du Travail, de l'Emploi et de la Solidarité Sociale, the Office des Personnes Handicapées du Québec, the Secretariat de la Condition Féminine, and lastly, the Secretariat aux Affaires Autochtones. Alors, le... 
All that information gathering work was done over the years when the previous commitments were ending and that were called the government policy directions on sexual assault. It is the outcome of all that consulting done all across the province and is produced as part of this strategy. Obviously, my mandate here is instead to represent the Director of Criminal and Penal Prosecutions. So I'll just speak to you with the few minutes allotted to us. I'm not going to dive into the 55 actions that the various ministries have committed to doing, but just the five that the Director of Criminal and Penal Prosecutions has committed to carrying out within that time frame. Two things need to be said first. Sexual exploitation is something new in the strategy. In the sense that, in the past, the government policy directions essentially talked about problems pertaining to what was called sexual assault. The decision was made to differentiate sexual assault from other crimes, referred to as sexual exploitation which is instead a type of internet luring involving children, prostitution, enslavement in connection with human trafficking. Those crimes are categorized under the term sexual exploitation. This is new in the strategy, and it's going to involve specific commitments. The other thing to bear in mind when talking about the strategy is that there are three components under which we want to take action. A prevention component, an intervention component, which is where our agency has put its actions, and lastly, a training component. The Director of Criminal and Penal Prosecutions is responsible for five of these actions. To facilitate victims' movement through the legal system, one of the actions that is central to our organization is adopting a program of meetings between the Crown Attorney, who will conduct the trial, and the victim. I told you that, in Quebec, Crown attorneys have the obligation to meet with the victims before authorizing a sex-related complaint. The purpose of that meeting is to confirm certain facts that are not the same as those covered by the program. The initial meeting and the authorization of the complaint are intended to confirm that the witness, the victim, is able to go through the legal process without being further victimized than the crime itself has done. It's also to provide him or her with services. The program that I, myself, work in is ensuring that the victim is able to identify a lawyer who will handle his or her case, to whom he or she is going to entrust a very intimate part of his or her life, and who forges a connection, and not the morning of the trial, but long before he or she has to deliver his or her testimony. This is one of the five actions that we have taken to better inform victims and their family members, even before they decide to report the crime that they were subject to, the idea of informing them even if they aren't yet working with us. And we have already started that work and have committed to continuing it as part of the strategy. It involves producing what are called information bulletins, available on the Internet, and that provide these people with information about the legal system in connection with the prosecution of sex-related crimes. 
à la poursuite des crimes à caractère sexuel, entre autres. There are info bulletins aussi, on a lot of topics. Il y a des capsules sur beaucoup d'autres sujets. But in particular, I feel it's important to speak to you about this one. Je vous parler de celle-ci. Donc, seront produits So, to be produced over the next few years are bulletins of this type. The next ones are those explaining the legal process for sexual assault and the one explaining the Crown Attorney's role. What can a person expect when they're a victim of sexual assault or sexual exploitation? What can a person expect from a Crown Attorney? I'm going to tell you about a third action, and its purpose is to strengthen the actions for combating the crime of sexual exploitation. And I must tell you that I, personally, am thrilled that it is done annually. There is training given annually to Crown Attorneys. And in the training to be given next summer, next summer until 2021, the focus will be on ensuring that all Crown attorneys are well informed in connection with these proceedings involving sexual assault as well as sexual exploitation. As you know, if you have to meet professionally with people who have suffered sexual exploitation crimes, you don't deal with them the same way, since it is a very different crime. I think it's necessary to exhibit a great deal of openness. This is the hope that through training, all Crown Attorneys' knowledge will be complete. It is assurance that we want to give victims who are considering going through the legal process. In connection with, more specifically, sexual exploitation of youth and children, one action is also for coordinating the prosecutions that are done across Quebec for combating sexual exploitation of children on the Internet. And ensuring systematic sharing of that information and expertise by forming a cooperation committee against sexual exploitation of children on the Internet. That committee is already established. In every Quebec region, there are Crown attorneys who are members of it. This way, we hope to standardize how these cases are handled, but also share expertise and ensure that, even though computers are a part of our lives, that we're not overcome by the speed at which this technology is advancing and that this type of crime can be prosecuted. The final action that we already have in Quebec is a best practices guide for prosecuting sexual assault crimes. However, keeping this guide up to date is not well done, since the commitment has not yet been made to tackle that task and produce a guide intended for Crown Attorneys in the province to ensure that best practices are shared and ensure that the youngest people who may start getting into this type of crime have all the information that is available. This is a mammoth task. Ontario has done an extraordinary job. I have seen their work and Alberta's, too. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank every one of the panelists who shared um, the different promising practices from your different jurisdictions and also um, for giving us things to think about, about alternative um, processes and different ideas. Um, so um, thank you very much. I'm not quite sure if we have time for questions and answers. We were running a bit towards the end of the day. so.